next talk, we have Finn Morgan, uh, who's a teacher these days, though he is specialized in graphics, shader programming, and rendering techniques. And today, he'll be exploring depth buffers in detail. So welcome to the stage, Finn. Hey there. All right, am I up? I'm up. You are up. <laughs> cool. All righty. Shall I get stuck into it? Yes, go for it. Go right ahead. Look forward to it. All righty. Uh, that coming through okay? All right, I'll take that as a yes. Okay, yes. hey everyone. Um, my name is Finn Morgan, and today I'm going to be doing a deep dive into how depth buffers work. So, all right. Depth buffers are this thing that came about like, I don't know, 25 years ago, something like that, and made our lives a lot easier. Since then, we've figured out all these things we can do with them that are kind of cool. So to start with, we'll talk about the problem that depth buffers were trying to solve. So I've got this diagram that I <laughs> stole from my t talk last year, with slight modifications. Um, if you're painting a picture, like an actual picture with actual paint on a canvas, you can paint over things you've already painted, but you can't paint under them, right? And it works the same way when you send geometry to the graphics card. So when you render a blue circle and you've already rendered a green square, the blue circle copies over the top of what's there already. And so you can see how in that diagram to the right there, the blue circle looks like it's in front of the green square. There's no information there about where they actually are in three-dimensional space. It's just by virtue of drawing the blue circle second, our brain looks at that and goes, yeah, it's in front of it because that's how light works in real life, right? If something draws over the top of something, it looks like it's in front of it. And if you ask anyone that bottom right-hand image, what Im which object is in the front and which object is in the back, everyone will give the same answer. The, the red triangle is in the front of that stack of objects. Um, that's just a feature of how, how memory works, right? When you assign a value over the top of something, it overwrites it. Um, so what we can do is we can do what painters do, something called the painter's algorithm, where we draw distant objects first, right? So we draw the mountains first, then we paint the trees over the top of them and so on and so forth. And with all due respect to painters everywhere, this algorithm sucks. Um, why does it suck so much? Well, first off, it's quite expensive. You've got to sort things from front to back every frame, right? Not, not just once, because if the camera moves, the distance things are from the camera can move, because this isn't a painting, or rather every frame is its own painting. Some mountain that's in the background now might be in the foreground later. So the CPU gets loaded up with this sorting algorithm we've got to run all the time. But that's not where the crapness ends. Um, there's certain situations that it pretty much can't handle at all. I made this little picture here that I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this, but it's not immediately obvious which of those objects you would draw first, second, and third, right? You can't answer the question, which one's closest to the camera? And therefore, which one should we render last? To truly solve all problems like this, you've got to do something quite horrible and firstly, sort per triangle instead of per object. And secondly, somehow detect situations like this and split the triangles up into smaller geometry and then sort them, which is really, really bad, really horrible. Um, and that's to say nothing of sometimes objects intersect like two things are on top of each other and we've got to deal with that too. So this is terrible. The painter's algorithm sucks. This was a problem in the nineties and earlier. So the depth buffer is this really cool thing we invented and okay. Admittedly, don't quote me on this because I'm going from like an article I read in NMS as a child or something, but I think the N64 was the first piece of consumer hardware to have a depth buffer in it. I remember I remember Nintendo bragging about that in the 90s. A depth buffer is essentially, so we've got our color buffer, that's the image that gets presented to the, to the screen, but we've also got this other buffer, same resolution. So there's a one-to-one -one color pixel and depth pixel. And each depth pixel represents the distance from that pixel to the camera, right? 
So you can see this little demo scene that you'll be seeing a bit of uh, today. We've got Suzanne, the monkey, in the middle there, and these three Tauruses, or Tauri, possibly. And then on the right, you can see the darker pixels are the ones closer to the camera, right? The lighter it gets, the further away that pixel gets. Um, so this suggests a process, right? We've got a pixel that comes out of the rasterizer. Technically, it's a fragment at that point. It has a depth value, and it knows where in the image it's going to try and draw to. As in, it's got a, uh, it, it has its pixel coordinates and it has its depth value. So what it does is it compares its depth value to the depth where it's going to try and draw. So if we're trying to draw a tree and there's a mountain already there, maybe the mountain's pixel color is gray and its depth value is 100 meters away. Our tree color is green. Maybe its depth is 50 meters away. The depth test is the process of saying the pixel I'm trying to draw is its depth less than the pixel I'm trying to draw over the top of. If it is, the tree is in front of the mountain, render it over the top. At that point, we update the color value in the, in the color buffer with green. And critically, we also update the depth value in the depth buffer to 50 meters. But if the depth test fails, if the tree is 150 meters away, that suggests that the tree's behind the mountain and we shouldn't draw it. If we draw it, it'll look broken because it'll be like the mountain's transparent and we're seeing through it. If the depth test fails, we're done. We give up. The pixel shader does not execute. In fact, we wouldn't even know that the tree is green at that point. We just know where it is. Um, we don't calculate the color at all nothing gets written, the color buffer doesn't change, and the depth buffer doesn't change. So we abandon it early, essentially. So I've made this little video here to show what life is like without a depth buffer. I mean, not really, because if you don't have a depth buffer, you solve the problem some other way. But I just want to show you how broken things tend to be. So here we are with depth buffering turned on, right? We're flying around, we're looking at things. All is well, and apologies because these are pre-recorded. There we go. That's how broken things are with depth buffering turned off. See how we can see through the wall, see how the rings are not correctly drawing behind. In fact, the rings are looking really weird. <laughs> um, and there we are with it turned back on again. So depth buffering solves a lot of problems. And I'll just run down the list here because... This is, this is a point worth belaboring. Objects render correctly now without us having to sort them. That's already pretty great. Even objects that self-intersect or concave work fine. So I should, I should admit a little bit of a fib here. I've made this look worse than it naturally would because I don't have backface culling turned on. So the objects are drawing their own backfaces in some cases over the top of their front faces. If that doesn't mean anything to you, just ignore it. Um, but a concave object has the opportunity to have some parts of it that draw over the top of other parts, and you need depth testing turned on for that to look right all the time. Um, on average, we also get less overdraw. Think of this as, as per the paint, painter's algorithm. Every bit of paint we spend on a mountain that then gets covered up with a tree is paint we've wasted, right? We could have not used that paint. And the equivalent is if we render a mountain in the background, maybe that's got a pretty expensive pixel shader calculating a whole bunch of colors that the player's then not going to see. You know, we're doing lighting calculations and shadowing and all sorts of stuff just so we can draw a tree over the top of it anyway. That overdraw isn't free. And... So in many ways, the painter's algorithm is sorting the scene to make overdraw as bad as possible. Um, so just by not sorting the scene and letting the depth buffer sort it out, um, we've improved our overdraw situation because we're no longer going out of our way to make it terrible. If we do want to sort the scene, we sort it in the reverse order. Now we're painting the near objects first and then the uh, we paint the more distant objects later. And that 
helps overdraw even more. If we don't do it perfectly because there's self-intersection or something, it doesn't matter. It has a tiny impact on performance, but the depth buffer still saves us from things actually looking wrong. So the fact that this is an hour long talk and I'm 10 minutes in probably suggests to you that the depth buffer, cool as it looks right now, hasn't solved all our problems. So time to get to the depth buffer's Achilles heel, blended color, transparency, essentially. And if we have a think about what transparency is, it'll make it pretty clear the nature of the problem, which is say you've got a tree that's green and you render a smoke cloud in front of it that's gray. If the tree's at 50 meters and the smoke cloud is at 20 meters, then the color now in the buffer rep is some combination of green and gray. But what's in the depth? It's sort of not well defined. You can't coherently blend depth because I don't think you can meaningfully say that if there's a tree 50 meters away and some smoke in front of it 20 meters away, then the combination of these two things is how far away? 35 meters, 70 meters? Like none of these things make any sense and they're not useful for depth testing. So basically, in a world where objects are all transparent, the depth buff is of pretty much no use whatsoever, right? So you can cause this little problem on the right. If you decide to not believe me and say, screw it, we'll just render some transparent particles and just turn death buffering on and see what happens. What happens is what you see on the right here, where the billboard writes to the depth buffer and then the monkey head behind it erroneously throws its pixels away. And that will vary depending on what order you're drawing things in, but it's, it's super broken. So is there anything we can do about this? Um, now there's, there's one thing we can do to start with, which is recall that our depth procedure has two steps. We do the depth test. So for anyone who can remember the stages of a graphics card, that's roughly after the rasterizer, but before the pixel shader, we do our depth test and decide if we're going to actually go through with rendering this pixel. If it does, we update the color and the depth values in our target buffers. But what if we did all that, but don't update the depth pixel, only the color pixel? Is, that a, is there any point to this? I mean, that's a rhetorical question. I wouldn't be talking about it if there wasn't. But why would we do such a thing? Turns out that that's a pretty good way to render transparency. That gets us some of the way there because what we can do and what graphics engines will tend to do is render our opaque scene first with full depth testing turned on, right? So depth testing and depth writing. So we come away with, uh, I'm just going to go back a bit. We come away with these two scenes. We've got our color buffer and our depth buffer and we're ready to start rendering transparent objects at this point. Um, then we leave the depth test on, but stop writing our depth, our depth values. We're just writing color. And then we can get started drawing our transparent objects. We still need to suffer through the indignity of the painter's algorithm, but only against transparencies and other transparencies. This is a kind of okay solution. You know, like in a given scene, look around the room you're sitting in right now how many transparent things are there and how many opaque things are there. I don't know about you, but mostly I'm looking at opaque objects. And in reality, mostly that's the way things go. And in games, that's especially the way things go because of this restriction. Um, the few objects that are around that are transparent, you know, I don't know, maybe you've got some incense burning and there's some smoke, but there's going to be windows. There's going to be a few things, but not that many things. And lots of the time those transparencies are fairly simple geometry. There's camera facing quads for particles. You've got like big flat, like ocean planes or something like that, or windows. A lot of stuff, this is kind of mostly not too bad. 
as soon as complex geometry that's transparent or, or rather as soon as transparent geometry gets more complex sometimes we get headaches there's an alternative approach that we could consider which is just not really giving a crap maybe we can just draw transparencies however we want and that'll be okay um this is a surprisingly common technique in rendering in general is just not caring and hoping the player doesn't either you'd be surprised how often it turns out something doesn't matter um now i'll just take a quick moment to talk about the difference between alpha blending and additive blending without going into the details of the equations and stuff like that one of the things you might notice about adding two numbers together is that a plus b and b plus a are the same and by that token if you've got a bunch of additive blending to do it actually doesn't matter at all what rendering order they happen in if you've got a bunch of fire particles rendering rendering additively they can draw in front of or behind each other doesn't matter a bit it literally won't be possible to tell the difference with alpha blending not so much if you've got you know a piece of smoke in front of a piece of cellophane but you render it the wrong way around it will look different even with alpha blending though pretty often we can just decide we don't care and hope the player doesn't either why would the player not care well because not that many things are transparent you have to line the camera up so that like if the if the two things aren't overlapping on screen then it doesn't matter because they're not overlapping they're not blending over the top of each other so you have to have the camera in a particular location in order to cause the overlap to even have the potential for error and honestly it just kind of doesn't look that different um as recently as i know uh, breath of the wild if you go to one of those cooking pots that has a fire and a smoke particle coming up from it they don't render their particles in the correct order they just render them in whatever order they're created in so if you situate the camera so you're above the fire looking down the row of particles you can get this sort of funny tunnel effect if you situate the camera beneath looking up you don't get that effect because they're rendered in the wrong order but i'm betting a lot of people reading listening to me now have played breath of the wild and probably most people didn't notice and probably those who did didn't care that much um it's not it's not a heinous problem most of the time and if the artists and designers making the game know what looks broken and what a depth buffer can't handle then they can work around it and it's fine the key things to avoiding these pitfalls with transparent objects like most game engines as far as i'm aware i mean wouldn't surprise me if there's some fancy new way around this that some modern engines do but um the usual approach is a sort of just take each object and sort them by distance to the camera and this is usually pretty good this usually avoids the most heinous visual effects and basically things come out okay but it can trip you up if you have very complex transparent objects like animated characters or elaborate concave objects certainly if you're making like i don't know ice caves or something you're probably going to have a bad time having huge level geometry that's um that's sorted on a per object basis because you like you want to break that up you don't want the whole world to be one giant object um and self intersection as well you're often going to have you often have to uh, treat water as a special case um or just make sure that transparent objects don't go underwater and make sure you render them all after the water um one thing uh i've seen before in a student project with apologies because the student is probably listening to me right now don't worry i'm not going to call you out um was a situation where large pieces of grass geometry were being drawn with um with alpha blending turned on in a unity game and that grass geometry was huge like level sized and so whether a given transparent object rendered in front of it or behind it was kind of random it didn't look that wrong one way or the other but what looked very wrong was when the camera moved and the order popped and you get a very visible snap from one draw order to the other so 
that's something to be careful of. So we also have this technique. Uh, thank you, courtesy image courtesy of Minecraft there, as you can probably tell. Um, of one bit alpha, it's got a bunch of names. I've heard it called punch through or alpha threshold, um, probably a bunch of other names too. Now, this works great with depth testing because it's not really transparency. I mean, it kind of, you can see through it, it's kind of transparency, but there's no blending involved. There's no blending involved because every pixel is either fully there or fully not. It's either totally replaces what it's drawing over the top of, or it's not rendered at all. Um, it just occurred to me that, you know how it's common for objects that are fading out or disappearing to dither or to give the player a view through a hole, like a hole in an object to show the player, you'll tend to dither it rather than blending it. This is why dithering is like punch through if every pixel is either there or not. So you can still use the depth buffer. Um, this is great for objects that in real life are opaque, but in the game, they're too complex to do it with geometry. You'd rather do a texture map. So like tree leaves, grass planes, stuff like chicken wire or chain link fences or barbed wire sometimes, lots of stuff like that. Some engines will do hair like that, or that's probably not so popular these days, but um, the great thing about this, and indeed the main purpose of this technique is that because it's not blended, it works with the depth buffer. So if we think about the horrors that would be visited upon us, if we tried to do an entire forest of trees with alpha blended leaf planes, we'd be in a terrible state because we've got to sort everything. They couldn't cast shadows more on that later. Um, we'd have to like, they couldn't self intersect without looking broken. It would be really rough. One bit alpha tends to look worse than blending because you can't anti alias it, but this is why we do it anyway, because it works with the death buffer. Um, little side note, by the way, very understandably, there's this miscommunication that I've discovered recently. When a programmer says one bit alpha, the artist not unreasonably hears that the alpha channel has to be one bit, but the one bit nature of the shader's output, it's not talking about the shader's input. The texture doesn't need to be one bit. It's the, it's the render pass whose output is one bit. Um, you can actually get the edge of something. So this little diagram, this little image here is, um, those two circles are the same resolution of texture, but just one of them, the one on the right has anti-aliased alpha, even though it's being used for punch through purposes, it just looks way better. Um, so don't do that to yourself. If you end up with stuff looking like the one on the left, you can probably fix that pretty much for free by just using, by changing the asset. One caveat to that is that some real time, uh, compression, like I think DXT one only lets you have one bit alpha. So if you're really concerned about VRAM, maybe, maybe it's worth it. But if you need to up the res of your texture in order to stop having it look janky like that, that you've thrown away the VRAM advantage anyway. So just something to be aware of. I asked a bunch of artists in my orbit, um, a little while ago, if they knew this and a lot of people didn't, it's a pretty common misunderstanding. It seems. So there's a couple of ways we can do the depth test, the conventional and obvious way to solve the problem that the depth test was actually designed to solve was, um, was check if the thing you're rendering is in front of the thing that's there. And if it's not throw it out, we can also check if it's further away, we can essentially reverse the depth test, or we can check if it's exactly the same as what's already there. Why would we do these things? Because graphics programmers like to do weird stuff. I mean, not just graphics programmers. Um, the deeper you go into rendering APIs, the more you come across this thing where if the hardware is capable of it, the API will expose it. Not because there's any obvious reason why you would use it, just because the more you can use, the more hacks are available to you and the more creative you can get. So I'll give you an example of why you might want to only render objects that are behind other objects. 
So this is a screen grab from a game I'm a big fan of uh, called Death's Door. And that's our protagonist there, a bird, hiding behind an opaque object. You've probably seen this before. The game's third person. Your character can run behind a wall and they get like a little gray silhouette or something showing where they are through the wall, like an x-ray shader kind of thing. In practice, how you do this is you render your scene, all the opaque objects that the player might be obscured by. Then you render your character with a special gray shader and the depth test flipped. So it'll only render pixels that are behind other pixels. Then you render your character with the normal shader and the normal depth test. You do it twice because in some cases, like in this screenshot, the character is behind, part of the character is behind something and part of them is poking out. And so you can get both things to happen at once on a, on a per pixel basis. Um, there's also this thing called a depth pre-pass. This is where you render the entire opaque scene with only the depth buffer, no pixel, no color, nothing, uh, just the depth buffer. This is great because it kind of gives us a map of which objects are going to be visible by the time we've actually finished rendering the scene. So we do the pre-pass, which is very cheap, and then we do the full color scene with expensive shaders turned on and the depth test set to equals. That is, you throw out geometry if its depth isn't exactly what's already there. And this can get us perfect overdraw performance will only shade pixels if the player is going to be able to see them. Anything else gets thrown out. Um, I should mention, this is a bit of a throwback to my talk last year, that um, the talk on um, the Doom 2016 frame analysis is uh, they do a depth pre-pass and there's a bunch of reasons for it. If you want to go and have a look at that, um, pay attention to the bit about the depth pre-pass and they'll get some more information. So the thing that this all boils down to and all the cool effects we can do with a depth buffer beyond just the intended one is that the combination of a depth and a color image gives us a kind of three-dimensional model of the world that the GPU has access to, kind of. Um, and so we can do all these techniques that would otherwise be limited to a ray tracing sort of situation. We can do screen space reflections and screen space ambient occlusion and all this stuff. So long as we're happy to use this kind of crapified model of the world that's just based on the depth and the color. So this next slide, hopefully, hopefully this works smoothly. This is this little program I've written that helps us understand what the world looks like to a depth buffer. So. As you can see, I've, I've set this up so that the far clip plane is quite near. Things disappear fairly soon. Um, and hopefully the timing is not too weird, but I'll show you what the depth buffer looks like. There we go. So now you can see same thing's happening, but we're just looking at the depth buffer. And in a minute, what we're going to do is separate ourselves out to see the world as it truly is sort of, you can see the, the thing goes white um, at maximum distance and darker as it's closer to the camera. Um, at a certain point, we will step out of this world soon, hopefully. There we go. So you can see the frustum is what the game camera is seeing and that little version of the scene on a plane. And what I'm gonna do is kind of press all those pixels away from the camera based on the color in the depth value, the depth buffer. So white ones will go further, gray ones will stay closer, black ones won't move at all. Um, I'm sure I press the magic button in just a minute here. Come on, give it a sec. <laughs> there we go. So this is the world as the depth buffer sees it. You can see the 3D shapes but anything that's obscured from the camera is invisible, right? It can't tell the difference between a floating monkey head and an embossed monkey head shaped thing sticking out of the wall. With color turned on, now we have our full view of the world, right? So when the camera goes to where the original camera was, it looks pretty normal. 
but as soon as it moves out, we get this weird messed up version of the world. And this is the 3D understanding of the world that post-process effects like ambient occlusion have to work with um, or screen space reflection or whatever. It's, it's okay, but it's not everything. Whoa, some bad camera controls there, sorry. Um, as you can see, anything that's not on screen disappears. So we're back in the normal world here. I'll fly the camera up close and then go back into this. You see the Tauruses just disappear as soon as they're out of shot. We can't see anything behind us. And what that means is if you think about screen space reflection and how that, that old joke of, you know, the player's looking in a mirror or rather the character is looking in the mirror, the player can see the back of their head in the mirror as well as in the real shot, which is nonsensical. But when you look at this world that the depth buffer sees, you can kind of see right why, right? Because if the the world looking at the back of the um the character's head, we can see the front of the monkey's head right now, but it's the back of its head just simply does not exist in this world. The little portion of the blue torus that's obscured doesn't exist either. Anything that's not visible to the camera may as well not exist for the purposes. So this is the scene that we're kind of ray tracing into. Um, which it turns out is something. I appreciate, by the way, that in this picture, it looks like those things are just erupting out of the back wall with amazing speed. But that's just a screenshot of the video we just watched. So what we're seeing now is um, a view of the world the kind of crappy 3D representation of the world that our graphics card has accessible to it. And by doing clever texture lookups into the color and the depth map, we can kind of probe this 3D environment in the same way that RTX cards, well, all new graphics cards now, can do ray traces on the real environment. But before that, what we were doing is sort of fake ray traces into this fake environment. Now, we can improve this in certain ways. We can do our depth and color buffer with a slightly higher resolution and a slightly higher, as uh, not aspect ratio, a slightly higher um, field of view. So we have a bit more information on the sides of the screen. We can do reflection probes, which are essentially um, rendering additional versions of this thing from different points of view to give the give the GPU better information. But ultimately, this is a flawed view of the world that we can kind of do ray tracing on. So let's have a quick run down the list. Here are some effects that commonly don't work on transparent objects. We have screen space ambient occlusion. We have screen space reflections, as mentioned. Post-process fog will often get you weird results if there's a transparent object off in the distance. There are workarounds for that, though. If you're using a certain kind of shader called a deferred renderer, lighting often won't work. If you go and play some slightly older games, um, like uh, I remember this was true in Left 4 Dead, that if you shoot a zombie th miles away through the fog, um, the blood will show up very visibly, no matter how dark it is. Transparencies are always bright. Um, depth of field blur is not surprisingly based on the depth buffer. Um, transparent objects won't blur correctly as a general rule. Shadow mapping, um, I'll talk a bit more about that in a sec, but transparent objects can't cast shadows in most systems, post-process motion blur. The interesting one is um, GPU-based particles colliding with the environment. They do that based on the depth buffer. So what they're colliding with is this environment. The trick is you often can't, like, Obviously, that's a pretty bogus representation of the environment, but if a bunch of sparks are bouncing around all over the place, you usually can't tell how bogus it is because, by definition, the parts where that model of the world is wrongest are the parts where the player can't see. The trick with screen space reflections, however, is that the parts of the world where that model is wrongest are parts where the part player can't see but reflections let you see other things. Reflections let you see behind yourself. Reflections let you see round corners that the original camera couldn't see. And that's where we get into trouble. This is why screen space reflections are often kind of smudged and blurred and noisy and 
you don't want to give the player a fine mirror reflection using screen space reflections because it doesn't hold up. The player can see through the illusion. Um, so I've got another video here which shows what, what happens. I'm going to replace these colored toruses with these spinning icosahedra. Now these are transparent. If you look closely, you can see that they're not drawing in the correct order, but it's not that bad, right? Like they're correctly going behind Suzanne because she's opaque. Most of the time it looks fine, but there you can see if you look carefully. Now what I'm going to show you is what the depth buffer looks like. Look at that. They don't render into the depth buffer because they're transparent and that's fine. But what's going to happen now? We're going to see some fruity things happening, right? Things are going to get messed up. Looks okay-ish so far. And now it looks not so good. This is, again, this is the world that screen space reflections are probing. If the camera's positioned there, it looks okay. The further we get from that camera position, the more broken it gets. You can see the transparent objects kind of get blasted away from the camera onto the world. And there's various clever ways you can hack around that, but basically that is the information you have to work with sometimes it looks less bad than other times you can see that's pretty wild and broken looking now what this means is if you've got say a campfire burning with transparent particles in front of a river and you want the player to be able to see the particles reflected in the river using screen space reflections will you be able to see them well maybe those transparent icosahedrons they're definitely there right they're just not in the right place. Um, so if you want your reflections to show up, your transparent objects to show up in the reflections, what do you do? Well, you put an opaque object close behind them and hope that that's okay. There's, and this is the kind of the point of talks like this and why I specifically said artists and designers, especially it's valuable to know this stuff because you're the set dressers and the level designers if you know why this stuff breaks, you can work around that and make it break less, make it look better. So I also alluded to shadow casting and rendering a shadow map is really just rendering a depth buffer from the point of view of the light source. And I'm sure you can imagine that when I show you a picture like this, the shapes getting blasted away are the shapes of shadows, right? That volume represents, if the camera was a light source, it represents every point that the light touches. Anything that it doesn't touch doesn't get, um, doesn't get illuminated. So a depth buffer actually contains exactly the information you need to decide whether a certain point is illuminated or not, or, or occluded. And so that's why transparent objects don't work with the depth buffer. But leaves on trees that are rendered with punch through, they do work with a depth buffer and therefore they can cast shadows. So of course it would be too easy if the depth buffer just stored linear depth. It doesn't, that's a bit of a lie. Um, it stores a, it stores hyperbolic depth. Um, so I nicked this image from this very good and detailed description of how depth precision works, a uh, link down there below. Um, I'll try and get that link to anyone who's interested um, in the chat after, or if you're watching this on YouTube, hopefully it'll be in the description. Yeah, anyway. Um, what this means is you can't just read the depth buffer and give, get a coherent value. You've got to do a bunch of maths on it. Most engines will give you the maths you need though. So don't stress too much. Um, but why do they do this? The answer is you want more precision up close than far away. And these days, depth uh, Z fighting is not that common because depth buffers are pretty good. Um, but the idea is that if your depth precision isn't good enough, you get like as nowadays you get Z fighting basically because two objects are on top of each other, and no amount of precision will resolve that problem. Um, but in order to minimize depth fighting when objects get too close to each other, we'd rather have that precision up close to the camera where the effects are obvious than miles and miles away. Excuse me. Um, some very applicable thing for this information though is this. 
if you're making a game with that's like say a flight sim and so you've very reasonably you take a default camera and you push its far clip way out so you can see mountains and stuff on the off in the distance you might find you start to get some depth fighting uh because the depth precision is stretched over too big an area um what you can do to solve that is bring the far clip in but that'll make your game noticeably worse right at that point objects in the distance become less visible but pay attention to your near clip plane because if your near clip is set to the default value in, in unity i think it's 0.1 so 10 centimeters away how often does something get within 10 centimeters of the camera in a flight set probably not that often if you push that close one the near clip out you only have to push it out like from 10 centimeters to a meter and that'll do way more for your depth fighting than pulling the far clip in in fact probably well over half of your depth range is currently getting wasted right up close to the camera where nothing ever goes so that's that's a bit of a a bit of a tip there um since we're doing this deep dive i should also mention that the depth isn't just the distance between the camera and the pixel as the crow flies. It's the distance projected onto the view lines of the camera. It's the one on the left, not the one on the right. So objects in the middle of the screen, the depth buffer underrepresents how close they are. I think I got that right. Um, you can see this in some old games with the way the fog works. They do it the cheap way and just lift the value directly from the depth buffer. And as a result, if you want to look at something more closely, you can um, turn the camera to the side a bit. I think I might have that backwards. It's hard to think about. Uh, nowadays, we do the slightly more expensive version where we actually calculate the pixel's distance as the crow flies, which means you feed it through the... Um, you feed it, feed it through the camera's inverse projection matrix to get uh, the world position and then just use Pythagoras to get the distance between that and the camera. A bit more expensive, looks slightly better. Um, last thing I'll say is custom depth values. So you might have come across this concept of a depth bias. Uh, this is kind of just messing with the vertex shader's position output by changing its Z value. Um, the vertex shader, so in GLSL, for example, you're writing to a magic global uh, globally defined variable called GL position. Its Z value is what goes into the depth buffer. If you change its Z value, you change what goes into the depth buffer. Um, you can use this bias to force something to draw in front of something that it would normally be obscured by or sometimes using a decal like spray paint on a wall if you don't want it to Z fight, just depth bias it a little bit in, towards the camera. Another thing you can do, which not everyone knows about, is custom depth values calculated per a pixel in the pixel shader. This can let you do some cool stuff, but be careful of it because, because the pixel shader usually happens after the depth test, this forces something called late depth which means whether the pixel gets obscured or not, or whatever the depth test does, the pixel shader has to execute. So you don't save your paint, as it were. You don't save... Um, you, you save on something called fill rate, which is how quickly you can write the pixel's memory, but you still have to do all the calculations in the, in the pixel shader. So it's not as big a saving. Um, there is a way you can kind of pinky promise the pixel shader that your custom values will only ever be bigger or only ever be smaller than the geometric depth. That's getting really obscure. I'm genuinely not sure if most game engines even expose that. Um, someone who knows a lot about graphics and a lot about rendering. Uh, sorry, let me try that again. A lot about graphics and a lot about their game engine might be able to answer that question, but that's getting quite obscure. Um, there's one last thing, and I must apologize for the quality of the diagrams here. We also have this thing called the stencil buffer, which you'll note isn't the depth buffer, but it kind of belongs in this talk because the stencil buffer is what we do with the spare eight bits left over from the 24 bits per pixel the depth buffers usually have. Um, the stencil buffer can do its own tests before the pixel shader, the stencil test, just like the depth test. 
essentially the stencil buffer becomes a mask layer that you can render to. So a mask layer in the same way that a mask layer works in, say, Photoshop. So, okay, there's some really raw diagrams here. I apologize. These were done on not very much sleep, but hopefully they get the point across. An example of what you can do with stencil buffer is solve the boat problem. So this has come up in a couple of games I've seen. Um, I would remember thinking this in uh, Hellblade, where right at the start, the character's rowing like a, a boat through some water. And I remember thinking, come on camera, just, just give me a look at see if the water is getting in through the boat because it's a huge pain to solve this, right? Because of how boats work, they often have empty space that sits below the water surface. But if you just render this giant ocean plane, it tends to make the boat look like it's underwater. And if you think about how to solve this naively with like a CPU, it's a nightmare, right? You've got to do some horrible Boolean intersection, like a Boolean subtraction operation where the inside of the boat shape cuts a hole in the ocean surface. And then you're like dynamically modifying, um, dynamically modifying the geometry and re -up it, it sucks. This is a terrible uh, problem. And one way you can solve that is just getting your artist to, you know, fudge the shape of the boat a bit so it's deep enough or rather shallow enough that this doesn't happen but a better way of doing it this is here's the bad diagrams boom the a better way of doing this is so on the top we have the ocean floor then we render the boat then we render the water and the boat looks underwater but what we can do instead is come up with some little bit of geometry the shape of which represents the space inside the boat. And then we render that to the stencil buffer. So bottom left, the stencil buffer is gonna look like that black and white image, like a mask in Photoshop, right? Then when we, when, when we render the water with stencil test on, the water has a hole in it that corresponds to where the boat is. And then when we render the boat, it comes out fine. I did it in that order for clarity, but I should note that in reality, you'd render the stencil then the boat, then the water, because the boat's going to be opaque. So um, stencil buff is one of those things where most people don't know it exists. Um, uh, there's a million different things you can do with it. They use it. Um, some of the early real-time shadowing algorithms back in the Doom 3 engine were stencil shadows. Uh, there's all sorts of nifty things you can do. It's basically a hack buffer. Um, so now that I'm running out of time, I'm going to present really quickly things that I didn't get around to mentioning. As I was making this talk and realizing I was running out of time, I kept thinking, oh, there's this other thing you can do with the depth buffer. Um, I didn't talk much about Z fighting. Um, there's these things called soft particles, similar technique to fog sheets and similar-ish to water's edge, where you want to render, you know, when water sort of goes white and frothy near, the, near where it clips against the side. Those are all techniques done by checking the depth buffers value behind the particle you're rendering so you get your particles depth and the depth buffers depth and as the opaque object behind it gets closer in the case of a soft particle you fade it out so you don't get it nasty clipping against the environment you've got occlusion queries again something that i think most people have forgotten that graphics cards can do it's this thing where you send some geometry with no intention of rendering it but instead you ask the graphics card if i rendered this how many pixels would actually get drawn and how many of them would get thrown out by failing the depth test. Uh, that's how they do, um, what's the word? Lens flare. If you're looking up at the sun, but you don't want a lens flare if there's a tree in the way, you do an occlusion query. You can also do like early out optimization with stuff like that. Uh, there's also normal and depth bias when you render shadow maps is a thing. Um, Maybe there's some other things that I just can't think of right now, but basically, you know, those are some things to talk to me about in the discord. If you're particularly interested, that is all I can think to say about, uh, death buffers. So I think I'm pretty out of time. Am I out of time? No, that was good timing. Perfect timing. We, Excellent. we do have a little 10 minute, you know, gap between the next talk, but we can, we have a few Q and A questions that we can still get to. Cool. Uh, so 
I will just go ahead with those. Um, mm -hmm. Some of these you sort of some of these were answered pretty early in the talk, but um, I'll sort of say them anyway. It's the first two at sure. least are sort of like you've you've sort of answered, but I'll say them anyway because okay. I think there's a little bit more you can look into there. Uh, sure. The first question was from Bash: uh, Is the Pater's algorithm like Z index? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, my understanding is that um, Z index tends to be for ordering 2D situations. So yeah, pretty much with the added bonus that with in a 2D situation, usually the order of objects doesn't change. So you don't have to sort it repeatedly every frame. You just decide ahead of time. But that's that said, I'm only kind of familiar with the tech you're talking about. So that's my guess. Hopefully that's <laughs> a reasonable answer. Yeah, no, I think that's reasonable. Um... Uh, Giri asks, uh, how do you manage floating point accuracy for a depth buffer for a vast scene? So you also sort of talked about this a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, so in practice, the ways, the things we have available, you can request a 32 bit, um, depth buffer. My understanding is that that's kind of not that common to need these days. Another thing you can do, um, old games used to do this if they really needed an enormous uh, depth buffer was basically render the scene twice into the same color buffer once once with a near clip to set to say 10 centimeters and a far clip set to 100 meters and then again with a near clip of 100 meters and a far clip of like 10 kilometers and so you'd essentially end up with two versions of the scene one with the close object one with the far object and then you could composite them together later um, I think nowadays, mostly the solution is just depth buffers are okay. Now, like they're good enough that if you don't do anything too weird with your near and far clip planes, you don't need to do that. Or at least I haven't yeah. heard of people doing that recently. Yeah. I, I, I would do actually have something to add here. I developed yeah. VR and it is still a problem for us because of at least on the, the mobile player can do that. Set, <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty awful. Cause like you need to be able to do that. And it's also the game I'm making is open world. So it needs to also be really far away. Right. And the quests way of like, you know, rendering depth is more inaccurate. It's, it's done in a strange algorithm. So I've right, had to right. Deal with tons of sea fighting problems. I, I can imagine that. Seem like it's too obvious. <laughs> For what it's worth, I've actually I don't know if VR devs devs do this, but um, it's my understanding that humans can't actually perceive depth past about ten or twenty meters mm. anyway, mm. and so probably you could just do three run render passes: one for close objects to the left eye, one for close objects to the right eye, and one for distant objects for both eyes. Yeah how that would actually cash out in practice though i don't know i haven't experimented with it but um yeah if there's a if it's a big open world game it might be worth it because otherwise you're spending you're rendering all these distant objects twice for stereoscopy that doesn't work <laughs> if you That's see what i'm good. saying i do see what you're saying actually that seems like a genuinely interesting idea i see that how you could be rendering those far <laughs> objects like as an extra call but like it might be worth it for actually being able to render stuff yeah distance. yeah yeah, the the tricky bit would be not having brokenness yeah. at the ten meter slice. Is my guess. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, I I had a question. Uh, in sure. your death's door example, uh, with you know objects yeah. going behind. Um, yep. I assume that the character materials are have at least two draw calls um, because it's sort of two different. Um, yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure death's door's a Unity game, so I think it would be. Uh, yeah, however they do that in Unity. But yeah, it would probably be one material with two passes. And mm. so at a lower level, there'd be two different shaders. And one of the passes would draw with one shader and depth test set to less than. And then the other one would do a a different shader, a different material, and the depth test set to greater than. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, that... But yeah, there's a few things like that. Yeah, that, that's something that I sort of came to when I read that. Um, and then we have one last question from Slurp. Um, the image before, uh, this was about the crow's distance. Uh, oh, yeah. The image before was showing depth buffer straight lines versus sort of distance from pixel to camera. Is oh, yeah, what yeah, causes... yeah. Oh, yeah, that. Uh, 
Uh, is this what causes distortion when your game has really high FOV, or is that completely unrelated? Uh, that's I know what you mean, but that's unrelated. Funnily enough, um, a given FOV is only is distorted for all but the correct viewer's eye position. So, if you kind of imagine a ninety degree FOV, if you close one eye and position your head such that the angle like from your eye to the top of the monitor and your eye to the bottom of the monitor the angle between those two rays is 90 degrees then you will have no distortion because the the camera's distortion will counteract with the perspective distortion I'm sorry touch my mic that might have been loud um so if you set it a ludicrously high you know 170 degree fov and get crazy distortion don't worry you can just hold your eyeball like a millimeter away from the screen and then you'll have no distortion it'll all cancel out i that's that's bringing very vivid images to mind <laughs> staring like very close to the screen if you if you do that and close one eye you actually genuinely get a pretty cool 3d effect because when you close one eye your brain stops counting on stereoscopy <laughs> and starts counting on other depth cues and um and so if the game is nicely done and you're viewing it with one eye and with no distortion. You actually, you know, there's like 10 minutes of high quality 3D game you play before you get a migraine. So, you know, <laughs> life hack there. Someone's going to try that. <laughs> yeah, I take no responsibility. Um, <laughs> uh, let me just say real quick that um, the program that I had all those, like the monkey head demos and stuff for, um, I was going to demo that live, but it was too annoying to set it up with the stream. I'll... um. I'll chuck that in a Discord channel if people want to play around with it. I promise it's not like going to deliberately destroy your computer, but I did write it in like a day and a half, so I can't promise that it's the most stable thing in the world. That's that's awesome. I was seeing that it was really helpful. It felt like I could super easily explain to, like you said, artists and designers, like actually how Great. this works. Um, really, honestly, really helpful. Even even cool. the shadow, like lighting, just explaining that. It's like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, of course. It's a hard thing to visualize. Yeah. Yeah, so that's super helpful. Okay, I think that's all we have time for. 